Hey guys, welcome back to Community StarCraft 2. I'm your host, Magnet, and today's we're going to be talking about aggressive mech in TVZ, and this means we're going to be talking a lot about mech timings uh, and being more on top of your opponent rather than just kind of sitting back in your base. So most of the time when people think about mech, they think about, oh, I just have to sit around and wait until I have like 50 tanks and then go attack. But uh, this video is going to tell you how to take the fight straight to the Zerg and beat them down uh, early and often with mech rather than just waiting. So let's go ahead and jump into the game so we can start talking about this. Uh, the first game we're going to be talking about is Masa, who plays for Root, and uh, he's fighting Scarlet, who is by far one of the best foreign players uh, on the scene right now. So uh, mech's interesting. Mech is by mech, mech we basically mean anything that comes out of a factory and sometimes transitions into uh, starport play, like battle cruisers, banshees, stuff like that. But most of the time it's centered around factory. Uh, in this case, Masa is going to opt for Command Center first, so I'm just going to comment on this really quickly because it's not that important to the game. But uh, Because you can springboard off of this in several different ways, but Command Center first, she's just doing that because this is a four-player map, and it's unlikely your opponent's going to open up with like pool first or something like that, which is what you need to be concerned about. Um, you can open Reaper the same way you would in other videos that we've seen and still go into this same type of opener, so it's not that important. Um, it'll just get you a tiny bit more SCVs, a tiny bit faster third command center, but other than that, it's pretty much the same, since a lot of Zergs will just take a quicker third anyway on four-player maps. So, yeah, so uh, from Masa, he's going to basically be getting his uh, gas up in time to start a factory. And, of course, with any Terran build against Zerg, you're going to usually start out with Reactored Factory to get those Hellions out here. And you can see he does have the gas, and I'm not sure what he's waiting for to drop this, but he should drop it here any second. No, he's just going to start a third command center, so okay. So I was just commenting on a little bit about command center first. You can usually get a faster third, but this is a little risky. I would honestly prefer just to go factory and reactor first. So we won't pay too much attention to this right away, but it may be a, a kind of a recurring theme for mech to get a faster third base because you'll be in their face for most of the game anyway. So uh, the, the opener that Masa is doing, though, is two factories. So one factory is going to be on the reactor. The second factory is going to get a tech lab, and he's going to research Blue Flame with it. And this is one of the most common ways to get into mech and to stay aggressive with mech, more importantly. So we're going to see three Hellions being produced at a time. But your goal here is to disguise this and make it kind of look like a regular opener, obviously not with Reapers or anything. You can use Marines to deny as much scouting as possible. But the idea is to make this look like as regular of an opener as possible to go into something like bio or even really passive mech. As soon as the Zerg will see the second factory, they'll start to freak out. So you need to really place this somewhere that's hard for them to scout. So in this case, the overlords are almost always going to come from the corners of your base. So if this overlord starts to drift in, the marines can come kill it, hopefully before it gets there. But you could put this here, or you could even put this even in more extreme location somewhere right here, so that it would be really hard for the Zerg to scout it and once the Zerg scouts that, you may be in some trouble, so that's the thing you really need to hide with this type of opener. So It's going to be two factory blue flame. You can see the barracks heading over there to build the tech lab now. So one of these is going to be producing Hellions, and you're going to push these first few Hellions out on the map just like you normally would to make it look like a normal opener, but it's actually going to be something pretty wild. Um, and that's, that's part of what convinces Zergs that this is going to be a more passive play, because Zergs are usually used to seeing about six Hellions, and if you just show them the six Hellions, and do what you normally would with a Hellion opener, but then kind of bank up Hellions somewhere else and just run in all at once, you can deal a lot of damage, and the Hellions don't really matter staying alive for that long, other than keeping them alive just to be sure you're not going to die to something like a Roach Warren. So you'll notice that part of this build is that he's coming over here and he's scouting for a third base, which rules out any sort of two-base Roach or Baneling play. So these first few pairs of Hellions are going to do what they usually do anyway, and just kind of stay out on the map and make sure you're not going to die to any sort of all-in. But even the three factory production, if you knew something was coming across the map, you already have a tech lab on your factory, you can just make a tank and you'll be fine. So this is really flexible, really versatile. Now in this case, while the Hellions are starting to build up here, he's still showing that it's a normal Hellion player, at least trying to make him believe that, while the Blue Flame is on the way. He is getting a Starport behind it. He's going to start up some Banshees, which are going to prolong his harassment and keep him aggressive and in the Zerg's face for almost the entire game, preferably the entire game, because it's where you want to be with this aggro style. So I'm going to show you a couple of things as this game goes on and show you a couple of reads that he makes that makes him able to run this aggressive style. 
You should be kind of planning for aggro mech if you want to do that style, but sometimes you don't really have a choice. You have to just stay back and be a little more patient uh, based on the, the plays that Zerk makes. So we're going to see this here in just a little bit. Um, right now, all these signs are just trying to do is deny creep so that you can uh, have a better time. So if this creep was like way out here, uh, they would have more time to prepare from a lot of Hellions coming forward uh, and see this. It seems silly, but being able to see something here versus being able to see it here is a really big difference. Um, so you do want to try and deny creep the best you can. Don't burn scans or anything like that, but just try to get tumors that are active. So he's getting to the point where this is this looks normal. This is six Hellions. This looks totally normal to, to the Zerg. In the Zerg's mind, if this were bio, they would float this in there, they would see Stim on the way, um, and that's that's all they would expect. They wouldn't expect any more Hellions because it slows Stim down too much. But the good thing that you have with Mech is that you're going to be using these factories anyway. So uh, you can keep these spinning the entire time and you can just continue to make Hellions while you get your third command center up. Um, so, so this phase of the game, you're going to be kind of pooling up Hellions just a little bit. Most people like to go with about 10 to 12 uh, Blue Flame Hellions. Once Blue Flame finishes is about when that Hellion count will be anyway. But while they're doing that, the Zerg is going to have to invest everything they've got in defending that. If you are able or willing to just suicide your Hellions for uh, Zergling kills or uh, drone kills or something like that, of course be smart about it. But the idea I'm getting at here is that you can land your third command center or maybe start building it down here on the low ground while all that is going on. Because the Zerg is going to be so preoccupied with stopping your Hellion play that they're not going to be able to punish this very well. So. That's a, a big a big part of this aggro mech play and, and being able to stay in their face the whole game is that you keep it even economically the best you can. And uh, even if the Zerg produces a huge round of drones, you can still drop mules and pretty much make up for it if you have enough command centers. So let's go ahead and proceed and continue to watch this. So the Hellions are starting to pile up here. And again, you really want to prevent scouting the best you possibly can with these Marines. So you can see the one Marine starting to push this Overlord away. And the Overlord uh, didn't really see anything other than the third command center, so they really still totally in the dark. Right now there's nine Hellions rallying up with three more and an additional one, so this is a ton right now. And the Zerg still doesn't really have any idea. I, I think the Blue Flame was revealed by killing that tumor, so you want to reveal it as late as possible, but once you get about to this nine to twelve or so Hellion count is when you're going to want to start getting really aggressive about it, because the idea here is to kill a lot of drones and make them waste their money on things that are not going to hurt you. So, here's the, here's the difference that you need to be deciding here. Uh, by this point, this is when the double armories are going to start going down, so you can start getting into things like Hellbats and Thors. Um, but the idea here is you need to know what to produce off of this factory. Um, and there's a couple of different ways to play aggro mech, but the best way to play it is depending on how they respond to this first Blue Flame Hellion attack. So if you show them Blue Flame Hellions and they have roaches on the field, then you're going to want to make a couple tanks at least uh, and, and continue to fill in the tank production if they start if they continue to make roaches. You can't stay on a lot of Hellions, and in this case Thor, if they're doing a lot of roaches. Uh, and the difference is that if they go for a Spire and they make Mutalisks, then you can start mixing in Thors so that you can be really aggressive with about three or four Thors and start getting on top of the Mutalisk count before it gets too out of control. That's kind of the whole idea behind aggressive mech style. So we're going to see the Blue Flame Hellions come up here. For a little while, this is going to be kind of for our enjoyment and see how much fun it is just to burn down everything that Zerg has. You can see that he's clearly, or rather Scarlet is clearly unprepared with what's going on here. And she's trying to morph Banelings here, uh, as you can see on the side of the map, to try and surround these Hellions. So you do need, still need to be a little bit careful and a little bit mindful, especially if Zergling rung by is like this as well, because Scarlet knows that there's no way these Zerglings are ever going to do anything against these Hellions. But you don't want to get surrounded, and you want to be a little bit careful, so that's why he's taking his time to prod with these Hellions and not just running straight in there. So take some time to prod, kill a couple Queens if you can, and if no Roaches if no roaches report, if you're not being surrounded by any Zerglings or anything, then just go for it, man. I mean, just throw those things away and start getting into the next phase of the game. So... We're going to see Masa start to make that decision as well. So he's starting to come in here. There's really not much stopping him. And at this point, there's a free drone line against all these Hellions. It's like, LOL, there's no right decision here for these drones. And I'm going to kill a lot, uh, no matter what I do. This is another good idea and another good point with these Hellion openers, is you need good position. So if these Hellions all kind of sat on an arc right here and shot down the ramp, 
they could basically kill all these banelings and weaken a lot of these queens without really taking much damage at all. So you want to think about how you can get good positions. And now he's starting to see the spire. So the emphasis on tanks really needs to stop because tanks are not going to be useful against Muta plays. You're going to want to start supplementing this with Thors. And you especially want to start bolstering your, your production as your economy starts to kick in. So uh, an extra factory for Thor production and an extra factory for more Hellions is a good idea. So uh, be thinking about that. So uh, Hellions are burning down a lot of drones here. The Banelings start to come in. This is what I'm talking about with that positioning, is try to funnel these things as much as you possibly can so the linear shots of the Hellions can do more damage as possible. Oh! Big Zergling, or rather big drone hit right there. And you, may say, you might say, well, it doesn't look like he really killed that much. I mean, Scarlet cleaned it up and he lost a whole bunch of Hellions for nothing. But the army is still pretty decent. There's five Hellions on the map, which will take care of this little run by. Uh, there's a tank out, just because he didn't quite know what the transition was from Scarlet quite yet. And now that he's seen the Spire, there shouldn't be too much reason to continue making tanks, and we see that already. There's already a Thor on the way, rather than a tank. So that was the adjustment made so far. But even still, let's take a look at this. Uh, 28 drone kills, and all of a sudden he's ahead in economy. And this is where the aggro starts to come into play. If you're ahead like this, the Zerg has no choice but to try and re-drone up. And they're going to waste a lot of money and a lot of larva doing that. So. Uh, the best thing for you is just to keep the pressure on, not let their mutilist count build up too much. Then you won't even have to spend money on things like turrets because you're going to be in their face with a lot of Thors. So there's a lot of different things to be thinking about the way this develops. And there's those two extra factories we were talking about right now coming up. Uh, the Banshee is a good follow-up. It's not my favorite in this situation, but it's okay. Um, it can still do a little bit. If you can still continue to keep their drone count a little low, they won't want to produce spores at this point so at least that'll do a little bit for you but it I mean it's a, it's okay it's not bad uh, I would prefer if you are relying more on getting worker kills to just stay on the hellions and try to trade those out since as long as you know they're not gonna have roaches that you can stay aggressive so either way no big deal so Banshee coming in now can continue these worker kills and you can see the economy is still way in favor of Masa right now 16 worker lead and the two more factories on the way He's continuing Thor production, and he's going to have enough gas, and this is something you want to think about as well, is balancing your production based upon the amount of gas when you're using mech. So Thor's, each factory takes about one gas worth of mining, and uh, you also have to consider the gas required for upgrades. So if you're on three bases, you can produce two Thor's at a time while getting your upgrades without missing a beat. And the remainder of the factory production is going to be spent on Hellions, which you'll have for extra minerals anyway. So that's how you're going to balance out your production in this type of stage of the game. So uh, we'll continue on here. And like I said, you can base your ideas mostly around the aggressive style of mech, but aggressive styles really only work if you're on top of their worker count for most of the game. And you can see, you can continue to trade out Blue Flame Hellions for more worker kills if you want to. And on the other side, there is this Banshee still getting a little bit of kills, but uh, so th there's still a lot that can be done, despite uh, looking like there's not actually a lot being killed. This is actually devastating right now for Masa. 50 worker kills just means that he can basically attack as much as he wants. And your number for Thors when you're going to be fighting Mealus is about 3 to 4. You don't want to start thinking about pulling SCVs because it's not really worth it quite yet. But once you get that 3 to 4 Thor count, just take out whatever Hellions you have with it, especially if you've dealt a lot of drone losses, and just get up in his face and uh, make him waste time. And by his, I mean hers, since this is Scarlet. So, uh, yeah. Like I was talking about, you won't really need turrets if you're getting this on top of their worker kills, but it's still not a bad idea to put them in just in case they decide to try and keep you at your base with your aggro mech anyway. With this few mutas, you can just say, well, that's not really enough to take seriously. And you can see this game's almost over, so Scarlet's going to die in the first push to this. So Masa actually producing three Thors at a time, so really opting to dump his gas into a lot of Thors rather than stay super on top of these upgrades. But you can see they're still possible based on the uh, the way it's progressed. So no tanks, Thors instead if it's Mutas. And you can see here's a few first few units, first few Thors starting to piece their way together. And there's no way Zerg is going to be able to hold this based upon how this game is open. So uh, we can see that we'll just basically watch the Zerg die here. Uh, and this all was made possible based upon the reads that they make on the Spire and based upon the amount of killers that the Blue Flame Hellion opener was able to accomplish. So, a lot of factors going into this. You obviously do need to play this a little differently if you're playing against Roaches, but you can still be fairly aggressive with about five or six tanks against Roaches if you really want to play it that way. Um, the other side of this, 
that's not going to be covered too much in these replays because these replays are a little old. They're from Season 1 WCS. Is that the transformation from Hellion to Hellbat is available on your armory. So that's why you can be a little more aggressive with your tank timings. Um, is that you can transform them into uh, Hellbats and buffer against the Roaches a lot better if you decide to play it that way. So the new changes that are not going to be reflected in these replays really help out in terms of uh, this type of style against Zerg. We can already see 152 to 95 supply. Scarlet barely has enough units on the field to even resist the Hellion. So this game is 100% over, and we'll just go ahead and jump into the next one so you guys can see that. Um, I haven't seen most of these replays for a while, so I'm not totally sure how the second one opens, but we will find out. Let's see. Okay, MVP versus Snoot. This is a... I think this is a more normal opener. I don't think it opens with the Blue Flame Hellion, but we will see in just a little while. But MVP is one of the pioneers of mech, so if you're ever interested in getting more uh, mech games to look at, look for MVP replays and look for MVP in WCS and the tournaments he plays and whatnot. So uh, Snoot's obviously the Zerg. Uh, MVP is down here, and this one's going to be a little bit more, more prolonged, so it can show you that more prolonged aggression with mech can still be totally fine. It doesn't have to be all based around a timing. It can be based upon several pushes over and over and over and just getting good trades with your mech units. So this is going to be a reaper opener. As you can see, the barracks and the refinery are dropped on the same supply. So uh, this is what I was talking about in the previous game. It doesn't have to be command center first. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that blue flame option to run with the Hellions as well. Um, no matter what, Zerg will be expecting something like Reapers into Hellions. So there's a lot of ways you can springboard off of that, but this is going to be a little bit more of a standard uh, type of opener. The Reaper Harass here doesn't matter all this much. This is really normal stuff. Any ZB or any TVZ that opens Reapers, you're going to see the same thing, so we're not going to focus on that too much. So Factory coming down here, of course. Command Center coming down as well, and like we were mentioning before, because of this aggression, because he opened up with a harassment opener, he can't afford to just take a command center on the low ground with very minimal protection because Zerg is going to be really interested in stopping the Reapers or the Hellions or whatever else is on the map. Of course, Hellions shouldn't be out quite yet, but I understand where I'm going with the concept. So this time it's going to be a lot faster starport, and Snoot is on top of it. This can be for a lot of different things if you're running into a more aggressive mech style. This could be for Banshee, this can be for Hellion. Uh, drops or Hellbat drops if you get a faster armory. So there's a lot of different ways to play this. But also importantly is that Snoot knows what's going on and he's going to be investing a lot into stopping the series of harassments that's going on. So MVP just says, all right, whatever, I'm just going to take a third command center while all this is going on. Because I know the Zerg is going to be on his side of the map trying to defend this if I'm aggressive enough and if I don't throw my units away. So that's the whole idea with this aggro mech is staying on equal economies and punishing them for not having strong enough units to deal with your mech and not having enough units to run them over as well. So uh, Snoot just going to be taking a third base as well. This is a pretty normal timing for the third. And all these uh, Hellions and Reapers need to do at this point is try to deny creep spread. Not dying is their most important thing, but you also need to be looking for all-ins so that you can prepare for stuff like that. And again, the biggest way to deter all-ins, in this case you could actually just lift your command center off and the tanks are going to be more important than anything. Uh, MVP is opting to follow this up with a Banshee. It's not going to be a drop or anything like that. So like I was saying in the last game, that's good. Um, I would say Banshee is much better in this circumstance rather than with the Blue Flame Opener because the Blue Flame Opener already does the damage. But the, the Banshee in this one is to make this a lot more prolonged and make Snoot have to react in much different ways. More importantly, he's trying to force Snoot to go into a Spire because this all looks really normal. This looks exactly like a bio play from Snoot. You can, you can even see... What did I just press? I didn't do anything. You can even see from Snoot, he can see the Banshees coming out, and he can see it's only one factory because he has full vision of MVP's base right now. So this looks really, really like Bio, and that after this little stage of MVP's harass, Snoot's going to be fine for a while to get into more of a normal game with Mutas and stuff. So this is to try and bait out the Mutas and keep that aggression going from MVP. So, again, just keeping this force alive here, and like I was talking about in the last replay, a handful of Hellions, nothing more than six, looks really normal to a Zerg, so that's why the previous build was able to work out so well. Um, but Snoot's being annoying here, and this is something you def definitely need to be mindful of, is little run-bys like this. Banshees can of course help out with that. 
Uh, keeping a, maybe a Hellion or two back at home can also help out with that. So something you need to look out for as well. Uh, considering mech does still take a little bit uh, to assemble, so you do need to take that into consideration. But at any point here, MVP should be starting to drop factories. And I think that's why he's waiting to do that until after he kills these overlords. So the overlords continue to think that it's some sort of bioplay. But it's pretty much given away from this point. You would see Stim already on the way by now anyway. And MVP still being really irritating with these little timings. So trying to kill Zerglings, trying to deny creep if he possibly can. He's trying to use the Splash and the Hellions to do that. And the Banshees prolong this. It, it makes him have to build spores and it, it forces damage no matter what. So MVP getting in here once again. Snoot taking a lot of damage from these. Not a ton, but I mean still fairly significant uh, damage. And the fact that he has to make spores with this is incredibly annoying. So, uh, yeah. So getting up into the uh, the lair is Snoot right now. You can see Banelings and 1-1 one, one are on the way, so this is definitely going to be a Muta build. And if MVP can ever see the Spire, that's going to be a big deal. Let's check a look at the worker kills. So there's 10 workers killed for MVP, but he also lost 5 to that Zergling run by, so this is fairly normal for this stage in the game. This is still a pretty equal game, and this is stating that you can still run pretty aggro mech even if you don't deal a ton of damage with your Hellions. So uh, the, the dealing damage with the Hellions is not essential. It's nice to have, but it's not required. So here's the extra factories coming up now. The Viking is going to be poking around to try and deny Overlord, so he gets a lot less information on as far as what's going on. Unfortunately, he is going to take some damage here, and this is one thing I wanted to mention as well. This orbital over here as your third base being this early is kind of greedy, um, especially with more aggressive mech styles. You can afford to just make this into a planetary and just accept that the amount of SCVs you would lose to runbys and stuff like that is not as bad as it is to not have the mules. So. Uh, it's kind of a trade-off, but I think, especially in your own games and considering you don't have a million billion APM like these guys, 265 APM roughly, just make this into a planetary and play a safer game. Or at least play a more assured game that you can keep the pressure on them and not have to worry so much about uh, dealing with their counters. So by this point, the Zerg should even know that this is mech, because this is still a lot of Hellions even after the initial Hellions got killed. So the only thing MVP needs to be sure of is is this going to continue to be Zerglings and Mutas, or is this going to be some type of a Roach or a Hydra transition? So MVP really needs to stay on top of his scouting and figure out what this is. And as soon as he knows what it is, he can start to base his, uh, his Tech Lab factory production off of what he figures out. There can be a couple of assumptions made. Um, if he did see any Zerglings that had 1-1 upgrades, that's a dead giveaway that it's going to be Spire. Uh, nobody gets 1-1 upgrades and goes Roach right afterward. At least not very commonly, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if he could ever see this Spire, that would really help him determine what to produce off of his factories. Um, in this case, he's just going to say, you know what, I'm just going to go with one Thor to start things off. Actually, a couple Thors and some Hellbats. And even if it is Roach, they do okay for a little while. I won't have to make tanks for a second until I can for sure verify it. And now he's seen the Spire, so he knows. We must have just missed a scan or maybe the Viking flew in or something. So he knows what's going on now. And this is going to prompt him to continue to make Thors. And again, once you get to that number of about maybe 3 to 5, I'd say 3 is a little low. 5 is more assuredly going to be really hard for the Mutas to deal with. Then that's when you can start to be aggressive. And this is why being aggressive against a Zerg while playing mech is important, because Snoot right now has five bases. This is his fifth base that's coming up right now. And if this mech just sat around and let himself get harassed by Mutas, uh, then all of a sudden his base would go unchecked, and MVP is going to start to slowly die because he's behind in economy. So this is why you want to get up in their face if they're running any sort of Mutalist stuff to respond to your mech. Uh, so we're going to see MVP develop into this in just a second. He's going to go with just a couple Thors and enough Hellbats to buffer. And notice how he's leaving some Hellions behind because Snoo has done a run-by on him twice. He doesn't want to get caught against this again. And again, you don't necessarily need a ton of turrets, but it is a good little safety bench to... Bench, that doesn't make sense. little safety net to have... Uh, if you fall down, you need a bench, but it's a good safety net to have against Mutalists just in case they decide to counterattack against you. So the turrets are always a good idea. I mean, you, you can get away with not having them if you're just all over them and you're super aggressive, but uh, here we are seeing that uh, the Thors are starting to do work here and the Hellbats are definitely assembled. The one 
little control thing you need to be sure of is that you don't let your Thors get too far away from your Hellbats because if these get surrounded by Zerglings, then all of a sudden the Zerg has won because the Mulas can kill everything else with pretty much no consequences. So just be aware that you need to keep these together pretty well. And you can even see this starting to happen a little bit as this Thor is going to take some damage from Zerglings, but this is enough to, or rather not enough Zerglings to kill this Thor quite yet. So uh, just, just keep that in mind when you're pushing. And the Hellions do come over here and, and recover as well, but still, throwing a Thor away like this is pretty devastating. The Thors are really strong when there's like three or four of them shooting at the Mutas rather than just one. So we'll even see these Thors eventually die, but M MVP is still forcing Snoot to keep his Mutalist count low because he's going to lose a few to these Thors here and there. And he's still losing quite a few drones. Uh, you can see these Hellbats do have a decent number of kills, and the overall worker kills are going to start to rise quite a bit because MVP is going to be on him for a little while. And now we're going to see these drone kills rise because these are Blue Flame Hellbats and there's a lot of drones over here, so all all. all. So, uh, yeah, once you get caught out on the map like this with your Hellbats as well, I mean, they're pretty much going to die, so just kill whatever you can. But now all of a sudden the worker kills have risen just a little bit more, and another counterattack, Snoot is actually handling this really well, all things considered. So, uh, so far, just to kind of reaffirm why we're showing you this game is that you don't have to deal a ton of damage initially, and this can be a longer term and more viable strategy as the game goes on. Even little Hellbat drops or runbys here can be valuable. It forces the Mutalists to stay home while you might not have enough Thors to deal with them at the other side. So, building extra turrets, building these Thors. Remember, you also can repair your Thors if they're near a mineral line, so that's what he's doing here. He's still losing some SEVs. So, he's still doing okay. I mean, he's still taking a little bit of damage from this, but he's not dead, and he can still afford to be aggressive. And he'll still want to be aggressive as time goes on because that's really the only way he's going to deal with this, and if you get your Thors in there at the right time, sometimes you can get big shots on the Mutas. So, uh, this is an upgrade you're not going to see anymore, because this doesn't exist. Uh, so this is kind of funny, this is coming up. Uh, this is just to allow transformation from Hellbat to Hellion. It's since it's been removed from the game, it's just default on Armory now, so... Uh, again, his production is only Thor Hellbat until he has a reason not to do that anymore. And as long as it's Mutalist, it's really all you're going to want to do. You do need to make sure to protect these production lines, because if you take a lot of damage and you lose tech labs and stuff, all of a sudden you can't produce Thors. So even just spending a few extra uh, minerals on turrets here is going to help out a lot. But again, if they clump up too much against these Thors, you can get really huge shots, and if they lose a lot of Mutas, you can see MVP starting to surround these Thors, rather starting to surround these Mutas just a little bit. He should actually target a little better and hit these red ones. But uh, keeping the Muta count low is one of the biggest ways you're going to keep make this work, because one of the decent counters to this style is just to try to whittle down the Terran enough to the point where uh, they don't they can't ever recover from the amount of mutas that they're So little run bys here are going to help out reducing the economy. Again, if the if you're being harassed a lot by mutalists, your Hellions are not going to do a lot to help out with that. So just send them out there and get them busy and continue to build up. And then once you have enough, this is six doors now along with some decent uh, support. You can continue to go here, and because of the little run-by attempts, look at the workers kill. This is an insane game, 59 to 49, and more importantly, the Zerg is actually really low on drones, only 45 right now, and he has to spend money to replace those while you have a pretty strong army, so MVP still being very aggressive with this. He'll actually want to transform these into Hellbats pretty soon. Um, he doesn't actually have the upgrade there, so he, no, it got cancelled, that's right. But that won't be an issue again in the future, so... Again, there's so many Thors here. He can magic box and he can do whatever he wants, but he's investing so much into trying to kill these Thors that it's starting to become not really worth it. Um, the other thing that's a, a good point to make is that if you're on equal harvesters like this, you're actually going to have a pretty big economic lead because you're going to have mules and they won't. Um, and they're going to be focused a lot more on gas mining. So you can use your extra economy to make extra Hellions and just run in there and deal a lot of damage to their drones. So again, continue to be aggressive. There's hardly any mutas here, and if the mutas ever die with Thor still on the field, then it's game over. So that's what Snoot's de Snoot decides as well, and that's uh, what you're going to want to look out for when running aggro mech in this matchup. So this is already a 30 minute video. This went by pretty fast. I love mech. Uh, there'll be a lot more information on mech in the future for Terrans, and I know Terrans out there have been kind of irritated. There haven't been any mech videos yet, so those are what's coming down the pipe pretty soon, so look out for that. Um, and I'll be posting a lot more videos just about generic, uh, not generic, but I guess different strategic situations that people have trouble with. So look out for those in the future, and I'll see you at the next video.